Most of the rest of the novel is Bridge wandering around in the ruins or in the empty, abandoned city of Boulder. And while he's there, you know, he notices there's nobody there. I mean, literally not a soul. Um, but things like, you know, power still working inside. Um, and, you know, cars still work. Although there's a number of them that have stopped working after they crashed, but not because of the crash, it's just they run out of gas. So another thing Bridge notices when he gets in is that he's in the dome. When he went in the dome, it was nighttime. When he comes out, it's daytime, although everything looks muted because the dome uh, lets in light, sunlight, um, but it looks like it's coming through you know, sunglasses. While he's there, he crashes the car that he steals because a ghost appears next to him and starts talking to him. He says, why did you steal my car? Why did you steal my car? And then he almost runs, he runs through a ghost um, and crashes because he freaks out. And when he gets out of the crash, he looks around and there's just ghosts everywhere wandering around the place. Like, you know, a city's worth of ghosts. We find later that all the people that weren't um, a technomancer weren't, didn't have a mana engine. They've all disappeared, but they keep coming back as ghosts. And maybe at some point in the future, I will have an explanation for that. Like, I'll write a novel about that. Because I have a few theories about what, I, what it could be. about, And, and it's, it's theories, it's basically story concepts. Uh, I don't know that I'll ever write them. Time works differently inside the dome than it does outside. So, Bridge is there for only a few hours... Um, maybe a day at most, but it feels like two or three days. He walks from the edge of town to college, and there's only, you know, it's probably only a couple of two, three hours walk, but the whole day is gone by the time he gets done. Once Bridge gets to the, uh, the college, and he starts looking through the dorms, and while he's there, he hears something, as in some kind of activity, so he runs towards the sound of it, and what he finds is a soccer field filled with metal golems playing soccer playing football and on top of that is a dude flying or levitating now of course you know that's probably not nearly as strange as the stuff he's seen earlier with you know a giant flying dragon and all that so he kind of takes it in stride and he's a little getting a little pissed off at this point and he meets Wong uh, who is one of the technomancers and Wong you know, pulls him up levitates him you know, in like a invisible fist and is like who are you what are you doing here bridge explains the whole thing and and wong is kind of you know odd, oddly a little confused he is a 20 something um former grad student grad student now he's a research assistant or something like that uh but he's he's very young and extremely smart but very kind of uh let's say autistic but very socially you know rain man-esque you know He's very socially awkward, uh, but extremely, extremely smart. And he's using the Manny Engine to run basically a FIFA simulation. While they're talking, a car drives up, and three other people go to get out. It's Rossberg, uh, Lydia, and Janicki. And these are three of the other Technomancers. Lydia, blonde, early 30s. Uh, Rossberg, blonde, Norseman-looking dude. Uh, Janicki is probably in his early 30s, or mid-30s, early 40s, uh, bald goatee. Rothsberg and Wong immediately, just clear that they have a, a clash, and end up fighting. And I wanted to show uh, what the Technomancers could do. I wanted a wizard fight, basically. Uh, and I knew we would have some a little bit later on, but this was, I really wanted to show what these guys could do to each other and to other, other people. Why don't you come down here and say that to my face? Why don't you come up here and make me, Wong retorted with a puckish grin. 
Rossberg face was fire engine red by this point. Lydia's snickering didn't help, only serving to enrage him further. He looked down at his flesh fist, which was squeezed so tightly the knuckles had turned white. Bridge began to feel crackling in the air, building buzz of power consolidating a single point of electrical energy. Rossberg's fist began to shake and glow. Bridge unconsciously began to back away, aware at a cellular level that something bad was about to happen. That's it, Rothberg screamed, throwing his fist out at Wong. A blinding blue arc of lightning flew from his outstretched hand to strike Wong dead center with explosive force. Bridge felt the ground rumble underneath his feet. Small at first, it built until he could see the car shaking with the tremors. The ground imploded at the feet of the metal cocoon, a sinkhole about ten feet across forming before exploding outward and upward in a shower of dirt. The cocoon flew a hundred feet into the air before crashing in the dorm behind Bridge. Rossberg knelt gasping at the bottom of the sinkhole. His lab coat was soaked in sweat and caked with dirt. His arms were outstretched to his side, and he brought them crashing together in front of him in an exaggerated clap. Lightning arced from two of the light, lighting fixtures on either side of Wong, trapping him in a circuit of boiling electricity. Wong paid no notice to the lightning storm enveloping him, his fingers dancing. Bridge was unsure what was happening at first, but it quickly became obvious that the light from the electricity was dimming, draining into Wong's hands, forming a ball of lightning that grew with every effort Rossberg thrust into the attack. Wong was stealing Rossberg's power. Sickening realization struck Rossberg and he redoubled his efforts, pouring more power into his attack. It did no good. Wong had the upper hand. Fear wrote an ending across Rossberg's expression and he screamed, throwing his arms in front of his face to ward off the final attack. It was in vain. Wong redirected all the power back at Rossberg, throwing back a mixture of Rossberg's lightning and Wong's fireballs. Caught full by the blast, Rossberg's shield was too weak to save him. Bridge caught a glimpse of Rossberg's body being disintegrated, a Hiroshima shadow being wiped clean by a fiery wind, and then he was gone. Where Rossberg had crouched, there was only a blackened circle of earth and the melted remnants of the dead man's cybernetic left arm. Wong panted, his body covered in sweat with tears streaming down his face. The full realization of what he'd done was writ large in his eyes. Wong ends up killing Rossberg at that point, and I knew that you know Rossberg was a dead character from the get-go, and he was going to be basically a giant asshole who, while smart, wasn't as smart as his colleagues, um, which is what the deal with the with Wong being able to beat him was about. Is that he, his calculations, his math was not as strong as as Wong's, so Wong beat him, um, literally, just uh, melted him. And <clears throat> Janicki looks it over and is his less concerned that his colleague is now dead than with the fact that. Wong was able to generate heat that could melt an ash bone um, from the man engine. So it was all about the experiment. He didn't really much care about Rossberg. Uh, and that kind of plays into Janicki. Most of, most of his characterization is about, let's see how we can make money with this. Um, whereas some of the others, Rossberg was more about credit and glory and ego. Uh, Wong was just the experiment. And Lydia, Lydia Wong and Balfour were more about this is the experiment. Let's see what what we can find with it. So, Bridge gets taken to see Balfour, who's the head of this whole group, and there we get an explanation, which is where we cut to the other big interlude, that is from kind of an omniscient perspective, which is the backstory behind these five, six people, um, six people. Balfour, Janicki, Wong, Lydia, Rolfsberg, and Carl. Yeah, six people. We get the backstory behind the, the the six scientists who became technomancers. And I, this was one of those interludes that I had to I had to switch away from Bridge because I wanted to show and not tell um, what was going on. I didn't want the whole story to be told to Bridge. I wanted it to be shown to the reader. Where you had six scientists who. Balfour is the, the head of them, and he comes up with this idea in a dream of, uh, you know, this mana engine, which is basically me pulling a concept uh, about string theory directly out of my ass. I am not a scientist. I am not smart enough to understand some things. I did a little bit of reading on string theory, uh, so I'm well aware this is all fantasist bullshit. Let's just get that out of the way. But the idea is there's a par there's a particle um, that they fire across a dimensional barrier back and forth, and it generates energy. So the whole the whole concept was we're going to generate energy using this particle, and we're not splitting things, um, so there shouldn't be 
adverse radiation, so on and so forth. And it should be a self-sustaining uh, reaction. So a little bit of energy used to create the particle that gets fired across the dimensional barrier generates a pig of energy, you know, that is the everlasting gobstopper, at least as far as they, they know, because they just they, that's their experiment. So their their whole idea was we're we're gonna do this for energy. But along the way they keep coming up with things that that you know, inspiration or whatever, uh, until they finally discover that the this mana engine that, that creates this power um, can be used uh, to do all sorts of things, and they each they each get implanted with a mana engine, which is basically a, a little cybernetic uh, interface or something that interfaces with their current cybernetic gear, and allows them to, for better for lack of a better term, cast spells. They channel energy using certain uh, criteria that, that they create in their minds which in this case is most of, the, most of the time it's however you visualize things. It's, if for like Wong, it's visualizing specific equations creates the ability to fly, but not all of the Technomancers can harness that. They don't understand his, his equation, his math, so they have to use other things. And Carl uh, does, a, does a lot with hard, with hard light or, or light the, the, the use of light to create physical solid things, holographic things. Uh, so I guess hard light is one term I've, I've heard used for it. Um, solid holograms, I, I don't know. That, that's Carl's deal. Rossberg was always more of an engineer, so he can't picture, he doesn't picture the math so much as he pictures building blocks of things. I think we really discussed how Lydia sees things. Um, but Carl and Wong are the only ones who can fly. Uh, Balfour tends to use cybernetic gear without having to touch it. It's like he can make robot arms that are in the lab move without interfacing with them. He doesn't have to touch the computer. He doesn't have to jack in, any of that stuff. So we learn the whole story of, of those guys and how they created the mana engine. And then what created the, the dome was they were running a larger version of the mana engine to kind of something they call a glow bug, um, which becomes a technology later on in the series in that the the glow bug is a little bit device. You can attach it to an existing power supply, get a little bit of power into it, and then get a whole lot of power out of it. So this, the, the Technomancers eventually start selling this on in the black market on the streets to people who want to cut out the, you know, the big utility companies. Um, by basically saying, okay, I'm not going to cut my power off completely, but if I'm only using, you know, one-tenth of what I was using before and I'm getting the same amount of energy with a glow bug, I'm saving money. That's like, of course, the energy companies don't want that. That's illegal. Or so they make it illegal. They make the corporations and the LGLs make it illegal. So we get the explanation for the glow bug, and then this thing they created was a larger version of the glow bug. When they turned it on, it created the dome. You know, blew, it blew up, but the explosion didn't blow anything up. It just created the dome, cut off all the power outside the dome, and was self-sustaining. They eventually figured out how they were going to turn it off, but they knew that once they turned it off, they would have to answer for it. They would have to explain, well, what is this thing, and why is why have all these people disappeared and, and, and all that. So, of course, their thought process is... is oh shit, we're in trouble. And they knew they would be in a little bit of trouble, but they didn't realize quite, I mean, there's a lot, there's a difference between the trouble of running a, an unauthorized experiment using university property and all that kind of stuff, and suddenly 30,000 people are, are just gone. Um, might as well be dead. Of course, they freak out, and we come to find out that Balfour knows Michael Freeman, who's the hacker god that Bridge got help from in the first uh, first novel. Freeman had actually told him beforehand, look, if you get in trouble with this, call my boy Bridge, he can get you out of it, or he can do something. Well, so that's why they tried to contact Bridge when they did. The dome is what fucked everything up and, and made the, the, the seizure. Bridge crossed his arms with casual confidence as he began to tell the story. Well, the Christians, these Frenchies and Germans and whatever, captured this town called Antioch from the Muslims. 
One of the priests with the army, a guy named Peter Bartholomew, claimed to have a vision. This vision told him that a holy artifact was buried in some church in Antioch. He probably made the whole damn thing up to inspire the troops. After all, the Crusades hadn't been the cakewalk most of these idiots thought it would be. So he goes and digs up the floor of the church, and lo and behold, there's this lance head buried underneath the church. A miracle, he says. This is the holy lance that the Romans used to pierce Christ's side on the cross, he says. Spirit of destiny, Wong asked. Holy lance, spirit of destiny, who knows? Not important. They find this lance head and show it off to the army. The head crusaders, they're real skeptical. I mean, it looks just like one of their spears. They figure this guy's yanking their holy chain, right? But as soon as the grunts see this lance, they go apeshit. I mean, an ar any army that carries the holy lance of God cannot possibly be defeated. They'll just rampage over the heathens. And these happy assholes believed it. Maybe it was the starvation, the heat stroke, the fasting, or maybe their lance really was some kind of magic holy mojo. But whatever it was, the army starts winning. Guys are running in the battle, getting shot to shit by arrows and shit. They don't care. They're totally oblivious to their own wounds, slaughtering Muslims left and right, just batshit crazy suicide bombs and armor tearing ass from one side of the Holy Land to the other. They drive off the Muslims, but instead of thanking old Peter there, the leaders of the crusade accuse him of making the whole thing up. You know what an actual trial by fire is, right? Light up this stretch of ground between two points and force the accused to walk through the fire. You live, you're innocent, you burn, and you're a liar, liar, pants really on fire. Well, they put Peter through one of those, and he comes out totally unscathed. Scared shitless, but unharmed. They make him do it again. Once ain't enough proof, get it? He makes him look bad. But he makes it through again. Now, he's probably thinking he's either the luckiest motherfucker alive, or maybe God really has blessed him. What's that got to be like, going from scared of being a crispy padre to thinking you might really be some kind of messenger from God? The crowd fucking loves him after that. Here's the guy that brought them the bomb, the divine intervention that will save their asses from a slow, scorching death in some fly-ridden foreign shithole. They start to cheer. They start to paw at him because everybody wants a piece of this lucky divine son of a bitch. Everybody wants a bit of hair or some of his robe because if this fucker is blessed, maybe I can lucky rabbit foots my way to surviving this crazy ass war by pinning a pound of his flesh to my armor. And they pick at him for days. By the time they're done, he's been trampled and ripped apart by this insane crowd of fanatics. He inspires them to victory and he gets ripped to pieces for it. I heard that story when I was 12. Not sure how much of it is true, but it always stuck with me. The, the scientist stared at Bridget in confusion. Balfour asked, I'm confused. In this allegory, are we supposed to be the crowd or the priest? Bridge grinned. You're the lance, Mr. Wizard. This was Bridge um, trying to explain to him his thought process behind saying that this was magic. I mean, let's face it. For all intents and, magic, it, for all intents and purposes, it is magic to Bridge or to anybody else. The whole Arthur, Arthur C. Clarke uh, quote about how any advanced technology appears to be magic to, you know, a savage, to those less technologically inclined. So he thinks, all right, whatever, whether this is technology or what, we're going to call it magic. And he comes up with the whole idea of the technomancers. And he uses this story to explain what he means. Now, this story is actually from the Crusades, or at least it's from a book I was reading about the Crusades at the time or shortly before that. So this may be a story that you know has been passed down through the years in, in a historical story, or maybe just this one that I, this writer came up with. I, I would have to <clears throat> look it up for sure. But I read that story and thought this would be a great explanation for what Bridge is thinking, is he's going to create an event, a magic show. Um, and by the magic show, he's going to distract by look at the monkey over here and then the the scientists get get away but he also tells them like you know you're going to be on your on the run for the rest of your lives we can cover up kind of here a little bit about maybe you get you guys were caught in this but there's every bit of the possibility that this is going to follow you forever in the last uh, in the last few chapters he sets up their escape which is big basically a big train parade of of cars that turn into golems uh, and transformers that attack you know attack uh, the National Guard and such and then we get the final battle with Carl the Dragon and the National Guard where the National Guard kills Carl the Dragon and it's again it's a show it's a magic show it's a trick uh, that Bridge uses and he creates this uh, character this journalist character who's supposedly there and sees the whole thing and films the whole thing. This uh, Sanderson Fielding, Fielding, whose character we use a couple of times in the book, but he uses that to kind of spread the whole myth of, of the Technomancers through the system. 
and he doesn't quite know why he's doing it or for what purpose he wants to create this kind of myth, but he knows that he, he knows he, he cannot let this opportunity go past since he's already stuck in it in the middle anyway. We, this is where we set up some of the things in the later books with Bridge getting a Technomancer bodyguard named Mew um, and some of the stories from Tales from Bridge Chronicles. Okay.